If you're looking for a mattress, go with Helix Sleep. Their two-minute sleep quiz will tell you which mattress is perfect for you. You'll get up to $200 off and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash Pacman. Unfortunately, my uh, first two stories today are completely infuriating. In a moment, in a few moments, I'm going to talk about the latest with the spending infrastructure bill and just the pathetic nature of what's happened. And we'll talk about whether at this point progressives should just vote no and do everything they can to kill the bill. We'll get to that. But first, I want to start with the story of Stephen Donziger, the attorney who now is surrendering to prison. And it is an absolutely insane story. If you've not been following the story, it is just like a perfect example of so much of what is wrong with so many different systems that we have in the country. So let's read the latest report from Reuters. Chevron foe Donziger surrenders after losing bid to avert prison prison for the lawyer. Why? Well, let's look. Disbarred lawyer Stephen Donziger, who was convicted of criminal contempt after a decades long legal battle with Chevron over rainforest pollution in Ecuador, surrendered to authorities Wednesday after losing his bid to stay out of prison. The second U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals uh, a couple days ago denied Donziger's request to delay his six month prison term or grant him bail as he challenges his conviction and sentence. His uh, lawyer, Ronald Kuby, said in court documents Wednesday he surrendered and is in custody of the federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut. Quote, it is sadly typical of the degraded quality of justice in this case that the only way Mr. Donziger could prove he was not a flight risk was to show up and be imprisoned. Uh, Donziger is appealing his July conviction for criminal contempt and October 1st sentencing to six months prison by a federal judge in Manhattan. Now, what is this all about? The contempt case stems from post judgment orders in a civil case in which another Manhattan judge in 2014 barred enforcement in the U.S. of a nine point five billion dollar judgment against Chevron that Donziger won in an Ecuadorian court. The judge said the Ecuadorian judgment had been secured through bribery, fraud and extortion. Donziger, who was disbarred in New York last year, was charged with contempt in 2019 for failing to turn over his computer, phones and other electronic devices, among other conduct. Uh, The New York resident has been in home detention since August of 2019. Tuesday's Second Circuit order also expedites Donziger's appeal. So you have a situation here where Steven Donziger was fighting uh, this case in Ecuador against one of these big fossil fuel companies and rainforest destruction. And then for what many assert, and we'll get to this in a moment, are political reasons and the power of corporations. This has all been completely flipped and turned around on Donziger, who then said, guys, I'm not giving you my stuff. And now he's been held in contempt and now is being sentenced to six months for that contempt. Now, it's not just me saying this sounds wrong. The United Nations has ruled that the entire Stephen Donziger house arrest violates international laws. This is from a few weeks ago, close to a month ago. The U.N. human rights body said a former environmental lawyer's house arrest on contempt charges was illegal and called on the U.S. to release him. And this provides some context. Stephen Donziger in the early 1990s sued Texaco on behalf of a group of Ecuadorian farmers and indigenous people alleging major environmental harms by the energy company. We've heard those stories many times Um, for decades. These companies have known the environmental damage that they were doing through their fossil fuel uh, business. An Ecuadorian court ruled in favor of the plaintiffs in 2011 and ordered Chevron, which had since acquired Texaco to pay nine and a half billion dollars. Then Chevron countersued in the United States, asking, uh, accusing the lawyer Donziger of bribery and witness tampering. And then Judge Lewis Kaplan in the US ruled in Chevron's favor. And then Donziger was hit with contempt charges during the appeals process. When federal prosecutors in the Southern District of New York declined to prosecute Donziger on the contempt charges, The uh, judge took the unusual step of appointing private attorneys instead. Look at what is happening here. Rita Glavin, one of the attorneys previously worked for a firm 
that Chevron retained. So every reason to think this is Chevron wanting to get back at an attorney that effectively went after them for the environmental damage that they did. U.S. District Judge found Donziger guilty of contempt in July. In the ruling, uh, in its ruling, the UN's working group on arbitrary detention called Donziger's detention arbitrary, no noting the maximum penalty for Donziger's charges is actually six months. House arrest for two years without sentencing for something where you would only at the most serve six months. This, they wrote, means Mr. Donziger, having been under house arrest since August 6th of 2019, has already served the maximum possible penalty four times over. In this regard, the working group recalls that the Human Rights Committee has argued if the length of time that the defendant has been detained reaches the length of the longest sentence that could be imposed for the crimes charged, the defendant should be released. The working group's five international jurists said they were appalled by the case and said the charges against and detention of Donziger appears to be retaliation for his work as a legal representative of indigenous communities as he refused to disclose confidential correspondence with his clients in a very high profile case against multinational business enterprise. This is the worst of the worst of the worst. Um, this is very clearly um, retaliation by a company with massive resources, Chevron, um, against a guy. They allege that the settlement he obtained of nine point five billion dollars was done through bribery, but they've not proven that. Understand that the allegation was, well, they only got the settlement by bribing people and fraud and so on and so forth. It's not been proven. They managed to make that case by dumping legal fees upon legal fees to create a problem for Donziger. They got to a point where he was in a position of saying, turn over all these documents related to your private dealings with the plaintiffs. He said, no. Now he's in contempt. There is a maximum sentence of six months for that, but he was held under home confinement, house arrest for two years, even though the if found guilty, the maximum possible sentence would have been six months. Every aspect of this stinks. It Every effort was made to exhaust every legal resource possible. And uh, I believe it was yesterday or, or the day before. Yes, I think the day before it was decided that yesterday he would turn turn himself over to a Connecticut um, a prison uh, or, or institution, the Institute of Prisons or the Board of Prisons or whatever it's called in Connecticut for the six month sentence. A lot of people hadn't heard of this story. It is absolutely and completely bonkers. And uh, I don't think this is the end of it. And we're going to continue covering it. You all know that I am in general a pragmatist. I am a sort of a real politic realist. I understand that change often comes in small steps. I don't want to let the perfect become the enemy of the good. But it may be time for progressives to kill what is increasingly a gutted infrastructure and spending bill because there is almost nothing left in it. Paid leave has now fallen out of the Democratic package in an urgent scramble, as described by CNN, to secure centrist Democratic Senator Joe Manchin's support. Democrats are expected to scrap paid family and medical leave from their cornerstone economic and climate package, discarding one of the central planks of Joe Biden's proposal as they scramble to strike a deal with holdout senators. The plan's survival has been in question for several days due to objections from Joe Manchin. Biden's initial 12 week proposal of paid leave was scaled back to four weeks to try to get Joe Manchin support. That was rejected. Uh, Kirsten Gillibrand tried to find a compromise with Manchin. That didn't work. One of the people said, prompting Democrats to push it out of the package as they seek to scale back the proposal's overall cost and programs to meet Manchin's demand. Manchin made clear he would not move when asked about the provision, saying, I just can't do it. And now, as we're filming, this is about to happen. Joe Biden is expected to announce new social spending a new social spending framework to try to get every Democrat uh, on board. The steps that we are now talking about the increments that we are now talk, talking about are so small in terms of what's left of this bill that 
we may mostly have a pseudo slush fund for some projects called infrastructure. It'll be counted as a political win for the centrist Democrats. It'll be counted as a political win for Republicans by having been able to get all sorts of stuff removed. And it's going to be barely anything. And I am essentially ready to say, you know, it has some things in it that make sense. But the pick big picture is now so dire. It's so grim. It's so pathetic that it may be time to kill this bill and say, hey, you need us progressives for this, too. And you're losing us. What has been removed so far? My best understand you. It's actually hard to encapsulate everything that's been removed so far for a bunch of different reasons, including that there were different bills that contained these things in different negotiations. Paid family leave seems to be gone or will be gone soon. A tuition free community college. We already learned days ago last week that's gone. Uh, serious climate regulations uh, gone. Expanded Medicare eligibility gone. The vision hearing dental stuff that Joe Biden talked about doesn't seem to be in there. Prescription drug price controls. Nope. Universal child care plus making permanent the tax credit gone. Some kind of uh, tax to target the very, very, very richest Americans. Nope. That not going to be part of this bill, apparently, either. So listen, I get it. it this, this is very rare that I say actually overall because of a message that needs to be sent. Nothing kind of makes more sense than the scraps that are left. Rarely am I at that point. People who have been following this show for a long time know that. But it might be time with this bill because uh, this is going to it'll count as something was done when it's two percent, five percent, not by dollar value, but in terms of the components, five percent of what was supposed to be done and everybody but the left gets a win. Republicans who want nothing done, well, they almost get a win if this passes because there's almost nothing left of it. Centrists get what they want because they've managed to get all of the important stuff or most of the important stuff out of it or scale it down or whatever. So I am understanding, you know, I know other shows pretend that the country is way more left than it actually is and all this different stuff. I don't do that here. I feel like one of the things I try to do is give you an honest and accurate assessment of where is the country on a lot of these issues. The country is well to the left of this bill. There's no doubt about it. Um, and what we have at this point is I don't know if the term Pyrrhic victory even applies because I don't know that it's a victory, even a Pyrrhic one. I want to hear from you. Um, is this something that any progressive that has the ability to vote no should be voting no on because it's become so endlessly pathetic? Let me know your thoughts. You can find me on Twitter at D Pacman. We're going to take a quick break and we have much more coming up for you today. I'm really excited that uh, one of our sponsors today is Helix Sleep. I sleep on a Helix mattress at home. I absolutely love it. And that's why I reached out to them about sponsoring the David Pakman show. Buying a mattress in the past was always a huge guessing game for me. I didn't know what I actually needed. I didn't know what I would like. But Helix has a sleep quiz on their website. You tell them your body type, your sleeping position, your back pain issues you might have. And their tool matched me with a mattress that is perfect for me. It's cool enough at night. It's the right firmness. I generally just do way better sleeping these days because of the mattress. Helix was awarded number one best overall mattress for the last two years by both GQ and Wired magazine. It is well deserved. I can tell you firsthand every Helix mattress comes with a 10 year warranty. You can try the mattress risk free for 100 nights and they will even come pick it up at your house if you don't love it. But I know you will. All of my viewers will get up to two hundred dollars off your order and you'll get two super premium pillows for free when you go to the link right underneath this video. We have a, a great subreddit with nearly thirty five thousand of our viewers and listeners subscribed for free. You can join the discussion at David dot com slash reddit. That's R E D D I T. A few interesting posts I spotted this morning that I wanted to discuss with you today. One asks who can win in 2024? 
David, sir, if you read this, I'd like your take, despite it being too early. I just don't see Biden running in 2024. He'll be in his 80s. And I think the next three years will affect him far more than past presidents. Harris may be the presumptive nominee, but she seems like a weak candidate versus Trump or DeSantis. So who would be a strong candidate in 2024? Give five bucks a month to voter registration and outreach programs today, folks. Yeah, this is um, I mean, listen, that's the analysis I made about two months ago. And I said, we're not yet ready to really talk about this in detail because there are so many unknowns who will be the Republican nominee. Is Joe Biden running for reelection? If not, is Kamala Harris the presumptive nominee? But I've said before, most who wrote to me about it agreed, although a few people were, were kind of upset with me. Um, I see if it's Trump is the nominee in 2024. I see a, uh, a, a Joe Biden who will have been attacked for four years and will be in his 80s at that point as having a tough time beating Trump a second time. If it's not Joe Biden and it's Kamala Harris, I see Kamala Harris, who remains not particularly popular today, but there's still a lot of time to go. I see Kamala Harris having a very tough time against Donald Trump. And then if it's not Trump and it's right now based on polling, Ron DeSantis would be the, the most prominent name, although it's a, it's very early and this is why it's tough to talk about it. I see Ron DeSantis as a more competent version of Trump who also has a totally plausible chance of defeating someone like Joe Biden or Kamala Harris being from Florida could help him with the state of Florida as well. So I share the concern. I don't have answers. I'm asking all the same questions as this viewer. I'm coming to so far more or less the same conclusions, and I don't have the answers, but maybe people in the audience do. Another post I spotted asks, would you support something similar to a vaccine passport, but for antibodies? Seems like this would be something the left and right could compromise on, but I don't hear it being proposed from the left. I'm wondering if there are arguments against it or if people are even against it. So I guess the question is, if you could prove you have antibodies to the coronavirus, should that count as being vaccinated anywhere that you need to be vaccinated if you have antibodies? And there, it's it's very complicated. There's two primary problems, I think. One is antibodies as measured by typical blood tests measure only one type of antibody and it's only one element of immunity. We still don't know how does that number relate to your level of protection um, and ability to spread versus other types of antibodies and potential immunity. So that's part one. Part two. There's less consistency about natural antibodies and how long they last. We don't know if you're more sick. Do you develop more antibodies when you recover? It, all these types of things are still being explored. And so while there's still variability in terms of antibody development with vaccines, there's more known and it's more uniform and more consistent than the decay appears to be more predictable. So I think th those are sort of like the two main issues with saying we should have an antibody passport just like we do a, a vaccine passport. Also, it's significantly more expensive uh, to test for antibodies. And um, it also is much more involved than simply to go. You get a vaccine. It's free to the end user um, who would pay for, you know, different people have different blood test coverage through insurance. It, it starts to get quite, quite complicated. Uh, last thing. This is a very interesting article that was posted. All of the discussion of the worker shortage that we've been seeing. It's important to know that since March of 2020, the U.S. has issued 1.2 million fewer visas to work eligible foreigners. So a lot of the right wingers and by the way, this report is from the Cato Institute, not exactly a left wing publication. One of the reasons Right wingers are saying, oh, it's Pete Buttigieg's fault. It's Joe Biden's fault. Joe Biden is the Grinch who stole Christmas because of the supply chain issues and all this stuff. We already know the supply chain issues were an issue in 2020. Nobody was blaming Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao back then. Nobody was really blaming Trump for that. Now they're blaming Biden and Buttigieg. But the other issue is the U.S. has issued far fewer uh, work eligible foreigner visas since March of 2020, partially under the guise of the pandemic. Yes. That is a big factor because the U.S. counts on that labor um, and it's not being discussed at all. 
And it should be that that is a something right wingers may not even know about or may be glad about because they say these people are stealing our jobs, et cetera. Well, that's part of why we're having these supply chain and, and labor resource issues right now. Join the discussion at davidpackmancom slash Reddit. This is really, really great stuff we're going to look at now. Remember Trump's legal advisor, John Eastman? He's the lawyer who wrote the infamous coup memo with various ideas as to how maybe Donald Trump would be able to steal the 2020 election. Lauren Windsor, our friend from the undercurrent, has done it again and has gotten undercover video speaking to John Eastman, essentially just bragging about the entire memo, his role and everything. Let's take let's just go right into it. We've got video. We've got audio. The video is subtitled. Let's just jump right in and see. This is amazing stuff. We're huge Trump supporters. And we were act- By the way, this is Lauren pretending to be a Trump supporter. She's been doing this now for months and she gets people to put down their guard and say really horrible and damning things. Actually, at January 6th. Oh, yeah. We saw your, Did speech. I, saw your speech. Did I incite you to go down to the Capitol and riot? You actually incited us to become supporters of Claremont. Oh, good. Very yeah. good. Very good. Because, you know, and the work that you're doing is just so critical to saving our democracy. Thank and it's like, <laughs> we couldn't. She's so good at blowing smoke up people's asses. It's so funny. I support your work after that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That's very yeah. kind of you. So, thank you. You're, you're Doing the Lord's work. Well, right. I, you know, uh, Godly. Old, I, you heard me say it. My old professor said, if you're not catching incoming flack, you're not over the target. And my God, I must be directly over it. Because yeah. I, I don't think there's anybody who catches as much incoming flack, maybe than other than Trump himself, than I have. Biggest victim. Six months. I mean, what a martyr. Well, but I read your memo and I thought it was solid in all of its legal arguments. Yeah. And I just, I was floored that, that Mike Pence didn't do anything. I mean, why? So this understand what she's doing. She's she's continuing to blow smoke, you know, and saying that memo with like your six or eight ways to steal the election. I thought it was totally solid. And how dare Mike Pence not actually go forward? Didn't he act on it because you gave him the legal reasoning to do that? I know. I know. Now it's and now in a, in a piece in The Atlantic two days ago, they're already anticipating Trump winning in 2024. And they're using my arguments from that memo that they all said had no credibility to argue that Kamala Harris can block Trump. Kamala. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, I mean, come on, people. You can't. So basically, everyone's going to say you're being proven right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Except they're not saying that. Right. <laughs> so first of all, the idea that maybe the memo was sort of like in jest or whatever, he seems to really believe that that was a way to steal the election. But that's what they mean. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. All of your legal reasoning is totally solid. Yeah, yeah. It, there's no question. But uh, <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, just supporter to supporter. Like, why do you think that Mike Pence didn't do it? Well, because Mike Pence is an establishment guy. At the end of the day. How about that, huh? Trump's legal advisor, who came up with a way to steal the election, saying the reason Pence didn't do it is Pence's establishment. Pence did, Pence is too establishment to really do what needed to be done. And all of the establishment Republicans in D.C. bought into this very myopic view that Trump was destroying the Republican Party. Ah. And what Trump was doing is destroying the inside the Beltway Republican Party and reviving the Republican Party in the hinterland, right? What they all consider to be, you know, deplorable flyover country. And this uprising that Trump got ahead of, he, he didn't create the movement. The movement was there, yeah. and he saw it and got ahead of it. Um, but no, that's, they can't tolerate that because they all they all have nice, cushy livings inside. This the- guy is a true believer of this idea that Trump was this big threat to the establishment and he was coming in and doing this and doing that. And that's why Mike Pence and others uh, didn't uh, di- didn't help Trump take the election. The, if there is a, a, ever a true believer, it's this guy. Uh, we have another clip here and it's it's just as crazy. Let's continue watching. Do you think if like, Trump came down like on the six, like it would change things, would change the calculus a little bit? If he came down? Yeah, he said he was coming down. He didn't. Oh, down to the Capitol. Yeah. So understand the question here is, if Trump himself did march to the Capitol, like he said he was going to, would that have maybe succeeded in stopping the count? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Because because the the the, uh, the breaking of the windows stuff had already started before his speech was over. 
And if he got if he got down there, then all of that would have been blamed on him. I like how he minimizes the insurrectionist coup as the breaking of the windows. There was a little more going on than breaking windows. They're still blaming it, but they would have had more faces for it. Um, so, I, you know, and he'd been planning on coming down, though. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. So, yeah, uh, look, the whole thing was a, was a setup. I mean, it was a setup. Uh, John Sullivan, Antifa guy, got paid sixty thousand bucks by CNN to break in and get video of violence. Right? This is a fact. So, again, this got. This is how dangerous these people are. We didn't necessarily know with this Eastman character. Is he a true believer or did he get paid to write a memo like, OK, yeah, here's like a hypothetical, very hypothetical. This nobody's really going to pay attention to this. No one's going to believe this. This wouldn't even really work. I, I don't know. I'll just write it for you because I'm getting paid. No, 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 no. This undercover video seems to be making clear this guy is a true believer. He believes the Antifa conspiracy theories. He believes it was actually legally viable to steal the election the way he outlined in the map. It's it's incredible. Um, the old keepers and the proud boys had not just kind of wallflowers sitting on the side of the organization, but people instigating within the association FBI uh, plants. These were it, it was a setup. So the riots were Antifa and the FBI. And, and our, you know, unfortunately, our guys walk into the trap. He would have gone down there if it hadn't been for the violence. Yeah. yeah. Like he, he he decided not to go because people were engaging in violence and breaking stuff. Yeah. Because I mean he didn't want that. Right. No. And he and he immediately tweeted out what he said on his speech: go down there peacefully and patriotically, and then let your voices be heard. Right. That's what. Yeah. He said. Actually, what Trump did was even hours after there had been violent riots for hours. Trump reluctantly did a video where he says it's time to go home. But he mentioned we love you and you're completely justified in being here. I know why you're here. It was stolen, etc. But it's time to go home after just hours of pressure of people saying, Trump, sir, you got it. You got to say something. You got to get, get these people home. There's a third part to this interview, which as of this moment that we're recording today's show, Lauren Windsor has not yet released. But I encourage you to take a look at it when it is incredible stuff. And we'll have more on this on our Instagram, which you can find at David Pakman show. Don't forget that the best way to support the David Pakman show is by becoming a member, which gives you access to the daily bonus show, the regular show with no commercials. You also get access to our entire archive of every episode dating back a really long time and plenty of other awesome membership perks. Go to joinpacman.com. And use the coupon code BETTER21 for a huge discount. Join Pacman.com. It's great to welcome to the program today David Liss, who is a health services researcher at Northwestern University. He conducts research to improve the quality and value of primary care delivery. Uh, David, it's great having you on today. Thanks for having me. So, you know, in the context of Obamacare, but also more generally, there's the discussion of uh, of preventive health care, the idea that it's cheaper to prevent or treat something early than it is to wait until it becomes more serious. I think that intuitively makes sense to to a lot of people. Um, but that can take sort of a lot of different forms and shapes. One can be you go into the doctor every year and they feel around, listen to your lungs, et cetera. Um, that could include doing regular blood work, cholesterol, complete blood count, et cetera. Uh, then there's also other types of screenings, starting to do PSA and prostate exams for men at certain ages, colonoscopies, mammograms, et cetera. So there's all this different stuff. How can we start to kind of categorize these things and think about the impact on people's people's health from them? Well, um, I think. Uh, well, at least what we do here in the research world or in the sort of medical care world is that there's uh, um, an organization called the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and uh, that's been around for a while. And but what the Affordable Care Act did is that what it it took services that are recommended by this group, the USPSTF, as we call it, and services that are recommended by the by this group are now fully covered under pretty much all or, or certainly most 
insurance plans that people have. So uh, we're talking about some of the things you mentioned there, things like colonoscopies and colorectal cancer screening, uh, mammography for women age 50 to 74, uh, recommended vaccinations, et cetera. So there are many services that have been shown there's clear benefit. They can help people live longer and healthier lives. Um, and there's been this group of researchers who has really sifted through the data, continues to pour through it every few years, and they find that these are beneficial services. Other things like prostate cancer screening that I think you may have mentioned, PSA tests, even these kind of routine lab tests, a lot of those services aren't actually recommended to be done regularly. Maybe for some high risk patients, but for your average or low risk patients, some of those services are not recommended by this group and aren't necessarily covered for free through your insurance plans. Yeah. So, you know, the, there's this idea of uh, what is it that we're trying to do, like with a general health check and one answer would be, well, we're trying to diagnose something earlier in order to control it. And Absolutely. then a subsequent question, I guess, would be, OK, if we do that, are we improving quality of life or extending life? And and I guess the answer is not always yes. It kind of depends what we're doing, right? It depends. Yes. Um, but um, again, there are a lot of kinds of screenings we can do, a lot of kinds of risk factor checks that can be done where, again, if you catch it early and there are uh, available, well-known treatments, you can certainly be extending life and quality of life. Now, the problem there is that there, if you're doing things that aren't necessarily recommended, uh, maybe that, again, that could fall in the range of things like PSA tests, could be things like routine labs. There's a potential for a lot of these false positives, as you will. Maybe the test finds something and it, it's potentially worrisome, and it leads to this sort of cascade of testing, lots of worry on the part of the patient, additional testing, and sometimes all for no reasons, all for, sometimes for a false positive, mammography that happens sometimes. So what we, what we try to do sort of in the research world and the medical world is find a balance between uh, whether, the, as we've heard, I think sometimes when we think about the vaccination debate for, for COVID, where do the potential benefits outweigh the potential harms? And again, there are several services, certainly colorectal cancer screening being one where the potential benefits certainly clearly outweigh the potential harms. One of the things I read, and I'd be interested in hearing what your research has shown or your take on it, is that a lot of the things that are done that are kind of in the cardiovascular, under the cardiovascular umbrella, don't seem to actually reduce an individual's chance of having a heart attack. What is is can you talk about that a little bit? Is that true? What does it even mean to say that? Well, what, what I what I certainly can say is that uh, some of the bread and butter things we think about most re, most uh, stereotypically checking your blood pressure. Mm. It obviously happens at all of our doctors. Visits. That's perhaps the most or certainly one of the most important things that can happen in terms of helping people uh, identify a health problem and getting it under control. We have many, uh, you know, highly effective, uh, inexpensive treatments that uh, can help prevent heart attack, stroke, death, et cetera. Some of these other maybe more exotic kind of tests, again, uh, doing a lot of digging, uh, doing a lot of tests that aren't necessarily recommended. Again, that's where we're talking about the potential harm could outweigh the potential benefit. When we talk about the annual physical for a second and we have the parts which are a discussion where you might mention symptoms or answer lifestyle questions. And then you have the physical exam, which, depending on one's age, varies. And then you have here are the blood tests or other things that I want you to do. Everything but the physical exam could be done virtually. What do we Much know better, about certainly. the what do we know about the importance of the part that's happening in person with the annual physical versus the other. And of course, once you're at a certain age and there, there's a, a, you know, a, a prostate check that obviously cannot be done virtually. So uh, you're right. A lot of these sort of elements of these visits could be done virtually. Uh, what I would also say is that what some of our research has shown, uh, research, research really clearly shows is that the physical exam, some, a comprehensive physical, is not necessary. Mm. Uh, what uh, has been shown to be uh, clearly effective, and I think you alluded to there, is we're talking about lots of screenings, lots of, lots of risk factor checks. Uh, and again, as you said, a lot of that could be done 
virtually, could be done even on, you know, kind of sometimes via a questionnaire on your computer. Things like screening for depression, screening for problem drinking, screening for uh, smoking or tobacco use. So much of this, uh, these kinds of screenings can be done virtually. Um, what we're the I think what what's interesting what we'd like to learn is what can be done really well virtually what are some good models to do that virtually certainly there's a lot of work that can be done but let's say you do find a patient is depressed now if you've done that screening virtually how can you connect with them and get them in to get recommended care or and or you know things like blood pressure screenings if someone's experienced at it certainly they could be doing it if they have some, one of these blood pressure cuffs that could be uh, that could be used at home. That said, it's not always so simple, and I think uh, it'll be really interesting to see what are the balance, what, what, what can we clearly find that can be done well consistently at home or virtually versus what things need to be done in office, and how do we sort of get that sort of division of labor worked out? One of the things that seems like it might make it more difficult to ascertain sort of health outcomes and health status might be that people who do the annual physicals, maybe folks that are already more likely to maybe make healthier lifestyle choices or maybe eat a better diet or, or, or whatever the case may be. Is it possible to separate that out to really talk about the impact just of the physical and the, and the, the screenings? So there's, a, a, I think, maybe a couple things you mentioned there. Let me uh, again go first, go back and say, these physical exams themselves, we don't really need these comprehensive physical exams. Yeah. But as you touch on as well, uh, these visits, these checkups, as uh, I like to call them, uh, oftentimes what we find is that the people who are most likely to get these checkup visits are people who have gotten them previously. Maybe right. a year. For that group, we found um, the the potential benefit isn't as great as people who might be sort of high from higher risk groups. And for those folks who aren't necessarily as motivated, I would certainly encourage them to sort of think about getting one of these checkups. But from a from the perspective of a healthcare system or, or a health system, that's where we need to do a little bit better work in terms of identifying those patients and finding ways to get them in, finding ways to help them understand the need to come in and the benefits uh, for coming in, or if it doesn't involve coming in, doing some sort of a virtual screening, re meeting them where they are and doing one of these checkups, because that's where uh, really checkup visits have, we think, have the most value. People who haven't necessarily been well connected with the doctor, who might be overdue for preventive services, whether that's cancer screenings, vaccinations, et cetera. It's often mentioned that there are people who believe that the reason that a lot of these things are suggested, et cetera, uh, is a desire from medical practitioners to avoid um, lawsuits to say, hey, l listen, I, d I did my part. I did everything I'm supposed to do. We're going to add stuff. And the more stuff we add, the more likely it is I can say I didn't commit malpractice. I did everything I was supposed to do. In your experience, how, how valid is that concern or that assertion about the entire preventive care world? Certainly not. I would say certainly not agree with that as it relates to the entire preventive care world. You know, okay. as, as we spoke about a couple minutes ago, when we talk about for what most insurance plans are going to cover with zero copay for patients mm -hmm. as a result of the Affordable Care Act, we're talking about these high value recommended services that have been screened and are and are reviewed every few years by this panel of experts. And these are shown to be consistently high value services. Now, that's now there's that we need to strike that balance. We don't want to I, I come out and I say we want people to come in for checkups and get some of these recommended high value services where it's good is that, again, they're covered with zero copay. Most people are not going to have to spend a dime to be getting these services at their checkups, their cancer screenings, their vaccinations, screening for depression, et cetera. Some of those lower value services, some of the things that people, as you mentioned, might be sort of more skeptical of, uh, I think some of those things, there is reasonable skepticism, and some of those things the experts have shown, there isn't good value to those. But uh, for the typical checkup covered by your typical insurance company, we're talking about high value services that have been shown to be effective and, again, aren't going to cost people money to be receiving them. Related to this, and I don't know if you can say anything about this at all, and if, if not, that's fine. When we talk about the dental cleaning and now we're talking about dental health, um, number one, there's 
research into the connection between dental health and, and general health, which seems to be pretty compelling. And number two, it seems that in that case, we're really talking about something with very specific benefits. It, where in all of this does the dental cleaning every six months and with or without x-rays, which I know is a big uh, source of controversy for some. Yeah, I um, I don't have much expertise there. So uh, and, and my research doesn't really focus on dental cleaning that much. But as, as you said, I've heard that there's a lot of research showing that dental cleanings are associated, I believe, with good kind of cardiovascular and heart health outcomes, which is quite interesting, probably relates to some issues as as it uh, deals with things like inflammation in the body. Right. Um, right. But also maybe it speaks to the fact a little bit of how sort of siloed sometimes healthcare is in the United States and that a lot of us, you know, health, health insurance coverage is separate from dental coverage. And uh, those aren't maybe necessarily as sort of harmonized or as um, comprehensive as they should be in the, in the dental care area. But again, regular checkups sounds I know is a is something that is recommended for dental care and certain and has been shown to be associated with good overall health outcomes. Uh, very, very interesting. We've been speaking with David Liss, who's a health services researcher at Northwestern University. He conducts research to improve the quality and value of primary care delivery. Really appreciate your time and sharing your insights, David. Thank you. It's a pleasure. If you value what we do at The David Pakman Show, remember to support us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash David Pakman Show, where you can get access to behind the scenes videos, the daily bonus show, the commercial free daily show, as well as special discounts on merch, including hats, hoodies, mugs and T-shirts. You can support the show for as little as two dollars a month. Check it out at patreon.com slash David Pakman Show. All right, let's jump into the paternity leave debate. Now, I, I to even get into this, I think it's important to mention that the recent hubbub about Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg's paternity leave, it's not even necessarily about paternity leave. There's a homophobic aspect of this, which is the feminization of a gay man like Pete Buttigieg taking paternity leave, which really should be for moms. It's really for women. Has he been learning how to breastfeed? Tucker Carlson said feminizing a gay man. So there's like there's a homophobic aspect to it. That's that's one piece of it. There's another piece of it, which for some people, it's just political opportunism, which is under Trump. The Republicans weren't blaming Trump for the supply shortages that we had early during the pandemic. Under Trump, Republicans weren't bl blaming Trump secretary of transportation, Elaine Chao. Now, those very same Republicans are blaming Joe Biden and blaming Pete Buttigieg. So for some, it's political opportunism. But then there's also an aspect of this which kind of feels more psychological, either like a my dad wasn't around when I was little. So there should nobody should get paternity leave, kind of like a, if I can't play in the sandbox, I'm going to poop in it and shut the whole thing down um, or also kind of a um, antiquated tropes of uh, it being feminine to take time off when you've had a kid. Right. So, so there's a lot of different motivations for different people. The latest is Joe Rogan uh, weighing in on this during an interview he did with a Bridget Bridget Fetasy Fetasy. I'm not exactly sure how her last name is pronounced. I believe she's a comedian. Um, and again, they get into this issue of Pete Buttigieg's paternity leave. Uh, let's take a listen and then we'll we'll discuss. And it's What's like crazy is that Pete Buttigieg during this whole time is on paternity <laughs> leave. And you just so what they mean is during the supply shortages that we're having this entire time, Pete Buttigieg is on paternity leave. I want to go listen, man. I understand it's hard to raise a child, but um, isn't that supposed to be for the person who gave birth? It's crazy. Yeah, men you're take right. Paternity now leave? over 70 ships containing 500,000 containers are waiting offshore. 500,000. But he man. was right. saying that Now, those ships, Pete Buttigieg doesn't control those ships. Pete Buttigieg is one guy, a country of 330 million people. Even if you believe that it's the Department of Transportation that controls those ships, there's a deputy secretary of transportation and an undersecretary of transportation. The idea that it's because Pete is holding a baby instead of a phone, even though he's actually been participating in, in meetings anyway, 
the ships are stuck. It's it's such a silly, childish idea. It's That's like this funny. negative feedback loop that is rapidly cycling out of control that if it continues unabated, will destroy the global economy. I'm like, that's a nice one to just slide in there. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, so it's complicated, but I do know the trucking stuff has something to do with it too, because there was already problems with truckers. They kind of abandoned California. What does it look like two years ago? This is a visualization of like the data they used so on a map. So we're watching trucks just a or couple, ships a come couple in. Ships. You know, just like a couple 10. ships. This is 2019. This is last week. Why are there so many? Because they're all stuck. I mean, stuck. This, this is why. Oh, that's they, why? Yeah. Because they're, they're stuck? Yeah, they're all floating around out here waiting to find space to come into there to go wait. And they can kind of get in there. Like you said, if there's only seven out of hundreds of cranes emptying them, then oh. they're waiting. It's nuts. Yeah. Oh. It's nuts. And that's why you can't buy toys. And it's also affecting small businesses. Yeah. You know, the, it's okay. just. So the point here is they're blaming Pete Buttigieg for this. And isn't it women that are supposed to take leave when there's a kid born, not the men? Now, interestingly, Spotify, for which, you know, Joe Rogan now licenses his show, works for Spotify, use, use whatever term you want, uh, they give six months of leave regardless of gender. Uh, which is which is interesting. Uh, the other thing about this, actually, let's look at let's look at one more clip because I, I have some other thoughts, but they're relevant to this next part. I'm and I'm questioning what who do you believe should pay for something like I that? I don't know, but if I was an employer and I had a guy <laughs> who worked for me, I had a guy who worked for me who wanted to take three months off because his wife gave birth. I'd be like, what the f are you talking about, Mike? <laughs> Mike Even to support his did wife, you give birth to support his wife. While I pay him for free. <laughs> Do you understand that this is kind of most people when this happens, if they make enough money, the wife will not work and the father will work right now. That might be plausible if the man makes more money. Uh, I have friends where um, the wife is a doctor and makes more money. I have friends where the wife is a lawyer and makes more money. And it really doesn't make sense what Joe Rogan is actually saying. Um, and so even that already is based on a whole. This is just basically it's a suicide when you assume you, you got you guys know the thing. OK, all right. And then the wife takes care of the child and this is normal. Yeah. And then normal. What does that mean? These are such loaded terms. And unfortunately, this was not, you know, I think if someone else was speaking to Joe Rogan about this, you, you could say, what do you mean normal? Do you mean it's historically typical based on? Something that started during an era where often women didn't work at all and were less educated than men, which has been completely reversed at this point in time. You know, it's 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 this very kind of like 1950s thinking that's not really relevant today. The dad provides support when he comes home. If you're saying that the man and the woman should both get like three months off, this is a new thing. Yeah. Right. And new isn't bad. Now, like that's also fallacious. Continuing to do something the way it used to be done is not an argument. The fact that it used to be a different way is not actually an argument. It's it? not new in Europe, but it's we're not in Europe. <laughs> this is better. OK. And so then then we add in this idea of in Europe, the men are feminized. They're sissy men here in the United States. We're manly. So it's like they're hitting all the different tropes here. Now, I want to introduce a different kind of question into this. You know, there's this movement. Um, they're called men's rights activists. Now, there are people who believe some of the things men rights activists believe, and they're not actually men's rights activists. I think it's important to say they just kind of gravitate towards the ideology in some areas. But there's this whole movement which is about complaining. Women get preferential treatment on everything in the United States. Men get the shaft when it comes to uh, divorce. Men get the shaft and women get preferential treatment when it comes to police interactions around domestic violence. Women get preferential treatment and men get the shaft, you know, all this different stuff. You would think that they would be saying, hey, you know what? This is great. Women have gotten the preferential treatment on maternity leave at all or paid maternity leave. Now we're equalizing it. The men aren't going to get the shaft anymore. But that's not the perspective of many of those very same people. So just it's all stereotypical tropes. The Europeans as the sissy girly men, real men don't need time off in the US. Uh, I'm going to go to work and then I'll come home and then I'll hold the baby or whatever. It's just very antiquated stuff. And then the other thing, again, 
the context of blaming Pete Buttigieg, country of 330 million people, the idea that everything depends on one guy who's home with his kids. These issues started under Trump. No one blamed Transportation Secretary under Trump, Elaine Chao. It's pathetic. Last possible angle. Is it possible that there are people that are worked up about this whose dads weren't around when they were kids? Their dads didn't have any paternity leave, never mind paid paternity leave. And they're transferring that into the same type of thing we're seeing with student loans. Listen, I had to pay my student loans, so we shouldn't forgive them for anybody. Listen, my dad wasn't around when I was a kid, so there shouldn't be paternity leave now. Is there maybe that psychological element that's affecting some people's view on this as well? I'm not talking about Joe Rogan. I have no idea his family history. These are general uh, questions that, that I have. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. There's been a headline floating around over the last 24 hours that Republican Senator Ted Cruz defended giving Nazi salutes at school board meetings. Now, that's not true. I'm going to tell you right now that is not actually what Ted Cruz did. What Ted Cruz did is, is horrible and I'm going to play it for you, but it would not be accurate that Ted Cruz defends Nazi salutes. What Ted Cruz did defend is the fact that parents doing Nazi salutes at school board meetings is protected by the First Amendment. Now, I think it was still very stupid to do. Um, and it also is theoretically something which could lead to an investigation depending on circumstances. But that's actually kind of a second or third layer. So let's talk about what's, what's going on. The Daily Beast, Beast headline is Ted Cruz defends parents doing Nazi salutes at school board meetings. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, he, he certainly doesn't defend the salute. OK. Um, during a fiery Senate Judiciary Committee on Wednesday hearing on Wednesday, Ted Cruz at one point defended parents throwing up Nazi salutes at school school board meetings as protected by the First Amendment. OK. Um, Cruz, along with other Republicans, lambasted Attorney General Merrick Garland for directing the Justice Department to investigate the rise in violent threats against educators. Now, remember, the National School Board Association is the organization that asked that the school board protests at least be considered under the guise of domestic terrorism. That was not what the Department of Justice, FBI or Merrick Garland asked. They were asked to do that. And that's really, really important. So we're going to play the clip and we'll talk about the implications and, and different things here. So but listen very carefully to the language that's being used. I did a quick count just sitting here during this hearing. I counted 20 incidents cited of the 20, 15 on their face are nonviolent. They involve things like insults. They involve a Nazi salute. That's one of the examples. My God. A parent did a Nazi salute at a school board because he thought the, the, the policies were oppressive. General Garland is doing a Nazi salute at an elected official. Is that protected by the First Amendment? Yes, it is. OK, so I think we should be careful with our language. And so all the headlines saying Ted Cruz defends or supports Nazi salutes. He's doing something horrible in this clip, but he, he's not actually doing that. What Ted Cruz is saying is first of all, a Nazi salute is speech protected by the First Amendment. That's true. Now, the First Amendment doesn't insulate you from the repercussions to that speech. So Cruz is correct saying that a Nazi salute is protected speech and Garland agreed. That's not actually the controversy. That's a fake part of the controversy. No one is saying a Nazi salute is not protected by the First Amendment. But Cruz is using all of this to go to this idea that Merrick Garland told the Department of Justice to investigate parents doing Nazi salutes as domestic terrorists. That's number one, not true. And number two, it's a red herring. Merrick Garland correctly explains later in this hearing, the National School Board Association wrote us a memo saying consider whether some of these actions at school board meetings by parents are domestic terrorism. That's what the National School Board Association asked to have happen. It was not something Merrick Garland directed. But let's go to the next and maybe more interesting thing. Just because something is protected speech doesn't mean it can't be grounds for an investigation. It's you know, imagine that I say at a school board meeting, um, I've got a dead body in my basement. OK, just to come up with something. 
and then I leave. My what I said is, I guess, protected by the First Amendment. In other words, state run school. I'm allowed to speak. The school can't censor me, whatever. But you could still then hear what I said and say, oh, wow, we've got to now investigate you because of the content of what you said. I was able to speak. My ability to speak was not curtailed by the school, which I guess you could say is state government. But what I said can still have consequences. And uh, along the same lines, without getting into the specifics of a Nazi salute or whatever, the things that parents say at school board meetings could be used as the basis for investigations, whether it's uh, investigations into domestic terrorism, whether a parent in talking about you know, I'm against masks like I slap my kid around at home when they do something wrong, but I'm not going to put a mask on. Well, protective services could hear that and say, OK, you were allowed to say your piece, but we now are going to use the content of what you said to launch an investigation because you're saying you're smacking your kid around. So these are like two, three, four different issues. The lessons here are maybe not good to use Nazi salutes of examples of things that should be defended it, it no matter what, you know, maybe Ted Cruz can pick other examples. And make sure to look at the video, because really, I think it's an exaggeration to say Ted Cruz defended the salute. He was trying to make a point about its protection under the First Amendment, about which he is right. And then he goes into all sorts of other things that don't make sense. Let me know your thoughts about the segment. We have a voicemail number. That number is two one nine two David P. Here's a conspiracy theory that uh, the Alec Baldwin shooting was a false flag meant to cost, uh, to confiscate guns. Hey, David, it's troll man, the anti-intellectual. It's sad what happened with Alec Baldwin. The part that isn't being said is that that gun was planted with a real bullet. Planted. So that. Very conspiratorial language. The left has an excuse and a reason to say, see, we need to take reins on the guns. We need to regulate. We need to disarm the population of these guns. Why don't you mention that in your discussion? Because there is absolutely no evidence to suggest that this is the exact same argument that some made about the Sandy Hook school shooting when Barack Obama was president. It was staged in order to have a big national tragedy to then subsequently try to confiscate guns. What's pathetic is even after the Sandy Hook shooting, we couldn't even get universal background checks passed, never mind confiscating any guns. And the reason I haven't mentioned it, troll man, is that there is no reason whatsoever to believe that that's what took place. We've got a great bonus show for you today. Don't let this stuff rot your brain. Uh, sign up at joinpacman.com. We will see you on the bonus show. Thanks a lot for watching today's show. I just want to take a second to tell you about today's sponsors. If you're looking for a mattress, go with Helix Sleep. Their two minute sleep quiz will tell you which mattress is perfect for you. You'll get up to $200 off and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash Pacman.